Thank you. I want to make a few remarks, um, but say plenty of time for questions. And also, if you have anything to say or any questions uh, while I'm speaking, just, just raise your hand and uh, let's uh, have a conversation. Uh, these are very uh, difficult times right now. Uh, we've had, obviously, some great disappointments today from the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, particularly with respect to the travel ban. And I think what we're reminded of when the, the Supreme Court came down the way it did, which I strongly disagree with the decision, it was once again a 5-4 decision, uh, is of two things. One, the importance of the composition of our courts uh, and the role of the Senate in uh, confirming uh, or refusing to confirm the justices to the Supreme Court. And then second, the critically important role of the United States House and Senate in upholding and enforcing the Constitution of the United States, uh, particularly in situations where the Supreme Court or other courts are not willing to jump in and interpret the Constitution uh, correctly to prohibit the President of the United States uh, from, in an arbitrary and capricious and discriminatory manner, using his extensive authority. Uh, as president. Uh, so let me start with the composition of the Supreme Court and how critically important that is. Uh, I spent a good part of the year 2016 um, giving lectures around the country, writing op-eds about why the United States Senate should not only have a hearing for, but confirm Merrick Garland to the United States Supreme Court. And uh, a lot of my pitch was aimed at the Republicans, of course, were holding everything up. Uh, and I repeatedly tried to explain, first of all, how Merrick Garland was a moderate and somebody who even, you know, the Bush administration would have looked at very, very seriously, or any Republican administration would have looked at very, very seriously, particularly if they had to have a, a Democratic-controlled uh, Senate uh, to get a nominee through, that Merrick Garland was really the perfect candidate for the United States Supreme Court when the White House is controlled by one party and uh, uh, the Senate uh, by the other party. Uh, and the, uh, President Obama yeah, really made a very conciliatory move in, in nominating Merrick Garland instead of someone who was a, a, um, a, clearly a progressive uh, for that seat. And yet the United States Senate refused to even have a hearing. And I went down to uh, Des Moines and I gave a speech, obviously, trying to uh, uh, rattle the cages for Senator Grassley. Uh, I wrote an op-ed there in the Des Moines Register and then went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, tried to make things a little hot for uh, Senator Pat Toomey. Uh, but uh, Mitch McConnell was able to block even a hearing for Merrick Garland. But that has never been done. Uh, the Senate had never uh, simply refused to have a hearing for a Supreme Court nominee. Uh, and it makes a difference. Uh, and we're seeing that Justice Gorsuch has a very different um, view of the Constitution, not just than the liberals on the court, uh, but how uh, people would be toward the Senate. Uh, and that's where I think Merrick Garland would very well have been. Uh, the Senate's role in uh, having hearings for and confirming or rejecting Supreme Court nominees is absolutely critical. And I have to say, I don't think Donald Trump should be putting any more justices in this court. He is not able to or willing to uh, perform his duties as president as set forth the United States Constitution in multiple respects. Uh, but if he were to nominate anyone else to this court, if he's still in office, uh, it's extremely important uh, that the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee uh, ask very tough questions and get answers. I'm sick and tired of this answer that you always get, well, I don't want to rule on a future case. And then they say, well, you know, abortion, well, Roe versus Wade, come on, it's 45 years old. <laughs> and now we're getting into a situation where we have some decisions of this court. There are five, four decisions uh, with which many, many Americans categorically disagree. And today's decision on a travel ban is one of them. Citizens United is another. And I'm just going to tell you, if I'm on the Senate Judiciary Committee, I'm going to want to answer those questions under all. I don't want to hear that. I'm not going to talk about future cases. We'll find a vote against you. And that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, there is no uh, ethics rule saying that a, um, 
uh, nominee uh, for the United States Supreme Court cannot tell the Senate whether the nominee agrees or disagrees with a particular Supreme Court opinion and why. And if they want to fuss around with it and avoid giving straight answers, then fine, they can go get another job, so far as I'm concerned. Uh, we're just not going to be uh, 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 going through the avoidance game anymore in Supreme Court uh, confirmation hearings. Uh, so there, this is a serious problem, uh, the direction the United States Supreme Court is going. And that is something we're reminded of again today. But second, when it comes to enforcing the United States Constitution uh, and interpreting the Constitution, as well as enforcing it, the Supreme Court is not the only authority out there. The United States Congress has power in that respect as well. Now, of course, the Supreme Court could strike down an act of Congress. But in a case such as what happened today, where the Supreme Court is unwilling to jump in and tell the president that what he's doing is unconstitutional, even though what the president is doing is constitutional in the view of four justices of the United States Supreme Court, it is certainly the prerogative of Congress, if they are willing to, to have hearings in the United Senate, State Senate, and the House, and to get all of that information about anti-Muslim bigotry in the White House, in the State Department, in the Department of Defense throughout this administration, get the emails, get the documents that under today's decision they may very well try to withhold from the lower courts. Congress can get it. And they can start trying to claim executive privilege. Well, there's very little case law backing that up. Congress wants it, Congress can get it. And I'm going to make sure Congress gets it, and we're going to investigate what's going on with respect to this travel ban. It is a Muslim ban. We know it. And he's tweeted about it. He's talked about it as a Muslim ban. The Supreme Court may have chosen to ignore the extrinsic evidence. But Congress doesn't have to. Congress can have hearings and then decide what to do. And that includes impeaching the President of the United States in the House and convicting him in the Senate if in the view of Congress he has violated the United States Constitution. And he's he committed high crimes and misdemeanors. And Congress has that authority and Congress doesn't have to interpret the United States Constitution in this respect the way the Supreme Court chose to today. But this is just one of many, many examples of abuse of power by President Trump. So now the question is, what are our priorities when we elect people in the United States Senate? Is it a priority to confront the Trump administration for its infringement on the free exercise of religion, which is guaranteed by the First Amendment, for its infringement of the freedom of the press, which is also guaranteed by the First Amendment, for its denial of due process in immigration hearings at the border. We now have the president saying that we're going to deport people without even having a judge. And the internment of children in violation of the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment, and quite frankly, the cruel and unusual punishment clause of the Eighth Amendment. And of course, we can talk about his receipt of payments from foreign governments in violation of the United States Constitution. That one's called the Emoluments Clause. It just means profits and benefits. And yes, I have had to go to court as the uh, Vice Chair of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, brought a lawsuit in the Southern District of New York, and our suit was dismissed on standing grounds. They said, well, our organization didn't have standing to bring that lawsuit. And then the judge said, well, the court shouldn't have to decide this Congress should. Congress is not a potted plant, said Judge Daniels of the Southern District of New York. Well, now we're appealing that decision to the Second Circuit, but I also say, well, Congress is sure acting like a potted plant. So I think it's about time we've got to take that pot. We've got to shake it out. And that's going to be our job in November. Now, fortunately, on the emoluments, the foreign profits and benefits, Case. We have another one brought by the Attorney General of the State of Maryland, which has gone beyond the motion to dismiss because the Attorney General of the State of Maryland does have standing, according to the Federal District Court of Maryland, and so we actually are going to maybe get some discovery on that, be able to get a court order telling the President what to do. We have to go to court in order to get a court to tell the President not to take payments from foreign governments 
profits and benefits from foreign governments in violation of the Constitution. Shouldn't we be able to go to Congress and get the House and the Senate to do something about this? So one thing I hope we've learned today is that while lawyers can go into court, the ACLU can go into court, my team from Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington went into court. We had more success with the Attorney General of the State of Maryland. There will be some success in court, but courts won't do everything for you, particularly the very conservative courts that we have today. The United States House and Senate have a job to do, and they aren't doing it. So one of the critical issues in this campaign is how much do you care about standing up to Donald Trump and Mike Pence, having those hearings with respect to each and every unconstitutional and illegal act that has been committed in this administration, and then deciding on the appropriate remedy which I believe may very well be impeachment of the president, could be impeachment of the vice president, removal from office, we will find out. We need to have the hearings. I was 12 years old, 1973. I remember those hearings with respect to President Nixon. And evidence was on earth that also led to Vice President Agnew resigning in a bribery scandal. But Congress bothered to have the hearings. We had members of both parties were actually willing to stand up to the president, the vice president, and at least have the hearings and ask the questions, rather than what they're doing now, which is basically punting. It's the same thing they did with Merrick Garland's nomination to the United States Supreme Court. It was, we don't want to even have a hearing. We'll have a hearing talk about some spy that President Obama put into the Trump campaign something we learned about on the Fox Fiction Channel. <laughs> <laughs> or will I be hearing on, they just have to do with Hillary's email, I don't know. But this Congress isn't willing to do its job. So, I am going to tell you, it is a priority for me to hold President Trump, Vice President Pence, and the rest of them accountable. And that includes hearings of the House and Senate Judiciary Committee. And that may very well include the impeachment of the removal of the President of the United States. And that's just where I stand on this. This is a <laughs> This is not the time to listen to President Trump say this is about America first, as he is shredding our Constitution to pieces. And this is not the time to run a Minnesota first campaign. It's just not. Because in this situation, what is in the interest of the United States of America, all of the people of this country, is in the interest of the people of Minnesota. We're in this together. This is a threat to our democracy. This is not a time to go ask individual voters, well, what's your particular grievance with government here? What's the specific issue? That's important as well. We're here to represent the people. And there are lots of things that people are concerned about. But this is not the time to have the focus of a campaign be simply serving the constituents to provide whatever people may feel is in their economic interest. Because you can run a powerful economy for a while under a dictatorship. Germany had higher, better economic performance, higher growth rates in the early 1930s than the United States did, even under FDR. It took a while for FDR's programs to get going. Yes, Germany had a better economy for a number of years. That's some good numbers. Did that justify what was going on? Absolutely not. What did the world look like by 1945? You know, we need to take this seriously. This is a threat to our democracy, so it's a number one concern for me. And I will answer questions I'd like to discuss with you, President Trump. Now, of course, there are other things we need to do as well. We need to address what got us into this problem. Why did angry voters turn to a man who talked like a dictator and far too much of what he said in 2015 to 16 during the primaries did resemble the speeches that were given in Germany in the 1930s? It just did. You look at it side by side. But why did Americans, in a time of relative prosperity as we were coming out of a recession, and it took a while getting out of the recession, but why did Americans turn to an authoritarian leader? And it's because there is a lot of anger out there. 
And there's a lot of anger at government, at both political parties, and at a system that is perceived and actually does benefit mostly the very rich, the very powerful. And corporations that increasingly aren't just American corporations, they're multinational corporations. And this is a topic I wrote about in a book in 2015 that I published in January 2016. I never even mentioned Donald Trump. It's called Taxation Only with Representation. It's my book. It's about campaign finance. And what's happened to our campaign finance system, which was a terrible mess before the Supreme Court of the United States got involved in the Citizens United case and made an even bigger mess. But where we have now a constitutional right of large multinational corporations and organizations set up by those corporations and other vested interests to run election air communications right before our elections. And of course the politicians know about that and they're dependent on those groups. That is institutionalized bribery. The vast majority of the American people have no role in choosing candidates in primaries because that's wired ahead of time by the big money interests. And then they show up in November and they're angry and they're upset. And sometimes when people are angry and they're upset, they make some very stupid decisions. Because I know what the right decision is about Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. I wrote about that one in the Star Trek. Clearly, Clinton was the better candidate. But people were angry at the system. And they took that anger out on Clinton, but it was anger at the system. And Donald Trump could convince people that he was standing against the system even though he had spent most of his life in New York buying off the various politicians, both Democrats and Republicans, to get whatever he wanted. By the way, people thought he was a Democrat for years in New York when the Democrats controlled Gracie Mansion, the, the mayor. As soon as Mayor Giuliani got in there, he started to act like a Republican <coughs> because he wanted to make himself rich. But that's the system we've had for decades, and it's gotten worse and worse and worse. <clears throat> with a very, very few who are able to control politics through campaign money. We have to fix that problem because it is leading to a lot of anger on the left, on the right, and in the center. And voters can make some very irrational decisions when they're angry. And we have to reverse Citizens United. That means changing the composition of the Supreme Court. That's another 5-4 decision. Or have a constitutional amendment overturning Citizens United. And I went to Washington just a few days ago and gave a speech on that for a group called America's Progress. Uh, America's Promise. I um, also think we have to have transparency with respect to this dark money flowing into the political campaigns and in all these 501c4 organizations that run these ads. You watch a TV ad, you don't know who paid for it. Could be Vladimir Putin for all you know. We need transparency. President Obama called for transparency. Right after Citizens United was decided Congress didn't do anything. And a lot of Democrats in Congress didn't help him out with that either. Because they had their sources of financing. But President Obama was right on that. We need more, need more transparency. We need small dollar donors in. Just like we have here in Minnesota. We've got a tax credit. We need something like that on the federal level. So there's a lot we can do with respect to campaign finance, but we better do it, we better do it quick. Because our country's independence is in jeopardy. And then we need to go back and look at the economic situation. Because what we've had since 1980 is a growing inequality of wealth. I mean, the vast majority of the people in this country haven't gotten ahead at all. And yet, enormous concentrations of wealth at the very, very top. And we are, we are the only major industrialized country out there that doesn't provide health insurance for everybody. Everyone else figured it out with a single payer health insurance system. We have. I'm going to talk about that in this campaign. And I talked to a lot of small business owners and entrepreneurs. It's not just people who call themselves progressives politically who say we need single payer health insurance. We need to di divorce health insurance from your place of employment. That is a relationship that doesn't make any sense. People are stuck in jobs they don't want. 
which they could create a lot more value for the economy, be a lot happier doing something else, but they won't leave the first job because of their health insurance. Our system makes no sense. We pay an enormous amount for health care in the United States. And yet, many, many people in the United States don't have the health care they need. It makes absolutely no sense. Why is it the way it is? I would suggest that's related to the first problem, campaign money. Look at the power of the insurance industry. The political action committee set up by the insurance industry to protect their slice of the pie. They're not providing medical services or even inventing new drugs or medical devices or anything like that. They're just moving the paper around, collecting, taking a large slice off the top, paying out shareholders and executive CEO salary and the rest of it, and then setting up call centers to explain to everybody why their coverage is denied, <laughs> and then paying out something in benefits. But what, what does what the insurance companies have to do, do have to do with health and providing health? Services. I don't care service, nothing. They can protect that slice of the economy through their political action committees, through their campaign donations, and their funding of dark money organizations. They will seek to scare you that somehow your health care is going to be destroyed if we come up with a single payer system. Even if we give people the option of buying into a single payer system, a public choice, an option. They will oppose that because they want to protect their market share. Well, that's costing us, each and every American. And that's just the insurance companies. We can talk about the pharmaceutical industry. And I was at National Airport coming back from that speech I gave in campaign finance reform just two days ago. I looked up and they had a Pharmaceutical Industry Association has this great ad that runs right up, right above the uh, line. We're trying to get through the TSA line, you know, and of course it's all very, take a long time there to get through that line unless you've got a pre-check. <laughs> and so you there, you get all oh, nothing to look at but this ad and all these, you know, you have all this very scientific stuff about all the inventions and innovation in the pharmaceutical industry. It wasn't for particular companies, just for the industry. We all know what that's about. You know, making sure that all the staff members and so forth as they're waiting in that line get the point that if you don't support Big Pharma, you are against innovation and the creation of life-saving drugs. And then they can have some pictures of children who are being cured of these and those diseases by the wonderful drugs that they have invented, which is true. And though they don't show you the CEO and you know his or her salary and you know their corporate chat, obviously, but. <laughs> This is the problem. The same drug that is sold here for one price is sold for far less in other industrialized countries with a per capita income similar to ours. So all this wonderful innovation, as wonderful as it is, forget about the CEO salary and all the rest of the stuff that's being taken off the top, we're paying more. Why do we pay more? Because we don't have a single payer health insurance system and other countries do. And America are paying for the research and development that is helping people all over the world, including in other industrialized countries that are paying a lot less for that drug, and of course, once again, the shareholders' profits and the executives' compensation. And then here at home, we have the medical device industry. And I know it is sacrosanct in Minnesota, the medical device industry, so you're not supposed to criticize the medical device industry. Well, I'm just going to say what I'm going to say. It's just the way it is. They make wonderful devices. Medtronic is a great company. It's a great American, Irish company, whatever. Um, <laughs> just because you have a real headquarters here doesn't mean you really have to pay taxes all here. But anyway, um, that's a whole other issue. But, you know, they have a lot of great stuff. But once again, why should the same medical device cost Americans more than it costs Canadians, Japanese, or Germans. Because they have a single payer health care system and we don't. So their single payer negotiates down the price. And these insurance companies, as they great as they seem to be, don't seem to be able to get us this good a price. That's just not right. And you know, the Affordable Care Act sought to deal with a piece of that 
I mean, they should, they should have done is gone with a, at least a, a public choice option, a, you know, a single payer option for people. That's what they should have done. But they didn't do that. So they can continue to recognize that we have this problem of overcharging by medical device companies as well as drug companies. So they put a, a little tax. It wasn't even that much of a tax on medical devices. Try and take some of that money back and use that money to help people get insurance who couldn't get insurance. And of course, the medical device industry doesn't like being taxed. I don't like being taxed either. Nobody likes being taxed. But if we don't pay taxes, what is there left for us as a society? And that was, the medical device industry, like the drug industry, like the pharmaceutical industry, is making quite a bit of extra money because we don't have single-payer health insurance. They are able to extract monopoly profits in the United States and just a small percentage of that taken back in profit, in tax. And then they start lobbying against it. And I am not happy that the entire Minnesota delegation, Democrats and Republicans, simply because that's a home-based industry here in Minnesota, is coming out against the medical device tax. Congress decided to defer it for two years. You know, if the drug industry behaves that way, and they do, they're powerful in New Jersey. They'll say, well, we've got two senators here. And then the insurance company in Connecticut. That's two more. That's six Democratic senators right there. Not to mention the others who might very well be influenced. We can't approach healthcare this way. We need to figure out what system is best for the United States of America. So, yes, I would repeal the medical device tax. Why? Because I would have a single payer healthcare system. So, the single payer could then negotiate down those prices and make it very clear you're going to charge exactly the same here in the United States as you're charging in other major industrialized countries. If you want to sell it for less in a, in a poor country, okay, that's fine. I understand that. But the American people should not be paying more for drugs or medical devices than people in Japan or Germany or Canada. It's just not right. And we need a single payer to get that job. But PACs, super PACs, fundraisers, the CEOs, house, all of that, they've got the power, just like the drug companies and the insurance companies. So healthcare is an issue I care passionately about, but we aren't going to be able to effectively solve it until we confront the campaign money, the PACs, the super PACs, the influence of various parts of the healthcare industry on our Congress and on our president and executive branch. This is an issue I'm going to take very seriously. And I do feel strong that every single member of the United States House and Senate needs to divest themselves of conflicts of interest. And there are a number of members of the House and Senate who have pharmaceutical stocks and medical device company stocks. That should not be allowed. Just as Donald Trump should not be allowed to hold on to his business empire, cutting deals all over the world, Vice President of the United States. Now, I know it's legal. Because the criminal conflict of interest statute doesn't apply to the president, the vice president, and members of Congress. But it's not right. It would be a criminal offense if you would go to the Department of Health and Human Services as the secretary of HHS and on pharmaceutical stocks or medical device stocks and then start weighing in on health care. That would be a crime, probably a felony under 18 United States Code 208 for the secretary of health and human services. But the president of the United States can do it a United States Senator or a member of Congress can do it because they're exempt. Well, that's one more area where I'm going to support a bill that was introduced by Elizabeth Warren that would apply 18 United States Code 208 to the President, the Vice President, and yes, I would include the members of the United States House and Senate. The natural conflicts of interest should not be exempt. I'm going to tell you, I, you know, some of you will support me in this campaign, some will support Senator Sar Tina Smith, who's a very, very nice person, very smart. Uh, I'm going to tell you, though, if you do choose to support Senator Smith, or she wins this primary, make it very clear, she's got a salary paying the medical advice stocks. And, you know, that is going to, that will end that campaign. And, you know, I can say what I say, I don't have a lot of PAC money, super PAC money. The Republicans have $2 million or so worth of super PAC money they could dump into this thing. You can't have the United States Senator making decisions about health care and holding on to large amounts of medical device stock 
or pharmaceutical stock. It's a no-go. So if you choose to support Senator Smith for other reasons or whatever, but please let me, that is not going to work. Uh, we can't, it's not going to work. The American public won't accept it, the voters in Minnesota won't accept it. Uh, but, you know, she's not the only one. There are a lot of them out there. Uh, they're going after a congressman in, in uh, upstate New York and Collins. Uh, he actually buys and sells pharmaceutical stock while he's on the committee. You know, it's like you've got a little information coming in, it's time to buy, but more information, it's time to sell. He does too much of that, he's going to get in trouble with the Securities Exchange Commission. I think he's been referred over there for investigation. But the members of Congress should have conflict free portfolios. And the President of the United States, for crying out loud. You know, either he wants to be President of the United States or he wants to run a real estate company and be a hotel innkeeper. But I don't think he's good at all. <laughs> Last, we'll talk about the environment. Because the fossil fuel industry has enormous power in Washington as well. And they have their members of Congress who own stock in fossil fuel companies, as well as the many, many others who take PAC money from fossil fuel companies. That's why we're not dealing with climate change in this country. It's not just Donald Trump. We were making lackluster efforts even under the Obama administration. It was much better than it was before, but it's not what we could be doing, and Congress was dragging its feet and making it extremely hard for President Obama to do what he wanted to do with respect to climate change. Why? Because of all that PAC money coming in from the fossil fuel industry. And we need to call out the members of Congress to get that money. Republicans and Democrats, and yes, I will criticize Democrats, including the senator from West Virginia, who's taken a lot of money from the coal industry, the back pocket of the coal industry, and then he comes out and says he may want to support Donald Trump for president in 2020. I've had enough. I'm not talking to Donald Trump being anywhere near the White House by 2020. That's my platform. But, you know, we have had a lot of, almost all the Republicans are getting a lot of money from the fossil fuel industry and some of the Democrats. We need to call them out on that. This is why we're not addressing climate change. And, you know, we're in a very, very precarious situation. Every year, we delay dealing with climate change. It is going to be much more costly to solve that problem if we ever can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Painter. Uh, I'd just like to preface this question, since you are running for the United States Senate, uh, that I do believe that the up, uh, up ballot candidate should be uh, an example of the down ballot, if that makes sense. Uh, and since we're on the topic of fossil fuels, uh, and since you're in the third congressional district in Minnesota, uh, Dean Phillips has uh, is heavily invested in big coal uh, related to the Dakota Access Pipeline and other fossil fuel industries. His campaign has even stated that he is no longer invested in those companies, but has not publicly stated which companies he is divested from. Uh, do you believe that Mr. Phillips should come out and speak on that and disclose which companies that he has divested from? I believe that a member, of, uh, if he is elected, I, mean, I don't think people need to divest in order to run political campaigns. Uh, and the, the reason I'm calling on Senator Smith to divest is that she is now sitting in the Senate seat and accepted the appointment. So she should have divested before taking the seat. But I believe that whether it's Dean Phillips or anyone else, ought to pledge to the voters that they will divest from conflict-producing uh, assets. Uh, I think they ought to be in mutual funds, uh, and in, uh, you can be in mutual funds, diversified mutual funds, uh, you can be in treasury bonds, or, I mean, there are lots of investments you can have that don't create conflicts. Most people don't own individual stocks. You gotta be pretty well to do to get into that category. I don't own any individual stocks. It's all diversified mutual funds. So I wouldn't have to make a single change to my portfolio of investments. Uh, it's all just retirement accounts and mutual funds. Dean Bellis would. But I think what he should do, and uh, I think all of these candidates should do, is promise that if elected, they will get rid of all of that stuff. Particularly healthcare related and, and anything that's energy related. Uh, but a defense related is another category. Those are the three biggest areas, but I don't think they ought to hold individual stocks. There's no reason to. Why not just sell it and put it into a mutual fund? So I wouldn't want to get into, well, what does he own now? So but I think just ought to be a clear campaign promise. If he wins in November, he's got between November and January, whenever he's sworn in, to get it all out of there. So when he files that new entry report, a new House member report, 
it looks like mine. Might have more more assets on it, uh, but or zero, but it has mutual funds and conflict-free assets. And I think that's what he, and I hope he would do that. I think he would. He was very much committed to campaign finance reform and anti-corruption. I made a video with him on, uh, on the, the Citizens United and campaign finance. Yeah. So I don't think that, yeah, I definitely do not compare a sitting member of the House or Senate who has, I believe, this moral obligation uh, to someone who's just, just running for the office. Because people do run, and I think Dean's going to win. So I think he ought to be getting very tall. Yes. First, first of all, he gets the concession speech from uh, uh, Congressman Paulson, and then he calls his broker to sell. <laughs> <laughs> that or. So, there's a question back here, I think. Well, I was just going to say this gentleman brought up uh, Mr. Um, Phillips. Uh, let's hear, does you know what uh, Mr. Paulson has as far as his portfolio? No, ma'am. Because, because he's been in there, what is this, his 10th year? And we know where he is a medical device because he worked with Senator Klobuchar on outsourcing, getting Medtronic out. Who knows what else is in there because look at his voting record. There's oh, yeah. 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 Well, the two yeah. things upon the voting record. That's a problem. We're dealing with two sets of problems simultaneously with these people. We're dealing with the personal financial conflicts of interest. You can get that if you look at his personal financial disclosure report and see what stock he's got. But even if they're completely clean on that, for example, Senator Klobuchar is somebody who has a completely conflict-free portfolio. So she doesn't have, I mean, she has mutual funds and stuff like that. She has a portfolio that Senator Smith ought to be creating for herself, you know, pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> Uh, if, but uh, the other problem is the PACs and the super PACs, the campaign finance piece. So you get tons of PAC money going into elections. And I'll tell you, for someone who really wants to keep their seat in the House, a whole bunch of PAC money for the medical device industry is going to have as much, if not more, influence over what they do than if they own fifty or hundred thousand dollars worth of stock. So that's a huge problem. The PACs and the super PACs, the influence of the medical device industry in this state. The drug industry is getting into the state too. They don't have as many operations in the state, but their PACs will operate here big time. And the insurance companies and the fossil fuel. And I haven't gotten into the sulfide mining industry. Oh, boy. Oh, um, yeah. You know, uh, so that's the problem you do. It's two problems simultaneously. They're corrupting Congress. Financial conflicts of interest and campaign finance. Better sell both of them or big time. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up about the environment and conflict of interest because um, recently I, I um, researched Tina Smith and um, you know in February and March she, accep um, she accepted donations from PolyMed president and vice president presidents um, and from a minors PAC political action committee and uh, and then in April or May she wrote an amendment before the primary uh, to do, finish the, pop, the uh, land swap in, uh, mm -hmm. up north. Yeah. And uh, I think it's ir irresponsible, and um, I think it's got a conflict of interest, and it's almost like she was paid to do it. It's a mess, this polymet thing. Mm -hmm. I thought I had some charts in here. About to your right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm running against Senator Smith in this primary. But my, my battle with polymet is about a lot more than anything involving Senator Smith. Well, so I just wanted, I just wanted oh, to point out that, that information is on the Federal Election Commission uh, website. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. This is a problem. So that's part. So th those are the individual contributions to her campaign from the executives at PolyMed are a piece of a coordinated strategy here. By it's not really PolyMed. It's Glencore is the company that stands behind this operation, and Glencore controls PolyMed. PolyMed is a Canadian company that's going to build the mine here. Uh, but Glencore is a third of the stock, they have the debt, and most important, they have a right to what comes out of the ground uh, from uh, uh, when they get that copper nickel mine going. About 1% of what comes out of the ground is the copper nickel or whatever metals they want. The other 99% is just left here to sort of go into the water. 
that's what happens here, the pollution. It's a mess, sulfide mining. And we've never done this in this state. We do talconite mining, which is iron mining, and that's our mining tradition on the iron range. It's not called the copper nickel range, and that's for a reason. We haven't tried this before, and it's potentially an environmental, will be an environmental catastrophe. These people, a Glencore, is a Swiss company started by Mark Rich, who was this guy who got a pardon from President Clinton some 20 years ago. That's not one of the more commendable pardons from President Clinton. Um, and uh, now you've got a number of characters behind that. I think Mark Rich was out of it, but then um, Ned Ronschild is a billionaire in London who has a lot of mines all over the world, including one called Indomet, which was a disaster over in Indonesia, an environmental disaster, and all the investors lost money. Uh, so his family was pretty upset at him too, because I think he lost money for everybody all over London. But he has, he has mines all over the world. His big thing is mining. Um, and he is a partner with, among other people, Tony Hayward. Tony Hayward, he got into a partnership with, after Tony Hayward had to leave British Petroleum, because he is Tony Deepwater Horizon and Hayward. Remember him? Yeah. Um, and he got booted out of BP, went back to London, teamed up with <coughs> Nat Rothschild, and they were doing Iraqi oil deals. And then Rothschild recruited him to lead Glencore as the chairman of Glencore. So now Tony Hayward, with his wonderful environmental record, is in charge of, of, of Glencore. Um, and then uh, you have over here, Ivan Glassberg is the CEO. And he is originally from South Africa, but he's got a good friend here, uh, Mr. Putin, uh, and he has received the uh, Presidential Medal of Friendship from Russia. And one of the big investors in Glencore is Oleg Deripaska. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. He is the Russian oligarch under sanction. Uh, he is also a friend of, of Russia. They had some story in the British press. They're sitting on a yacht together, and they're talking about bribing a British a member of parliament and they start suing each other when they're accusing each other of being the one who said they were bribing the member of parliament. It's a nasty story. But this, that was a number of years back. So we got Oleg Deripaska in there. He's a client of Paul Manafort. Now he's under sanctions, so they're very quickly trying to unwind all the financial relationships between Glencore and Oleg Deripaska. Now I could go on and on about this corporate structure, which I started investigating. Most of this is the British press. Because here in Minnesota, you just hear it's Paul again. And you know, a bunch of people running around looking very Minnesotan, you know, like flat shirt and everything. Maybe <laughs> going to fish. And and oh yeah, it's the same old trick. This is the way the British colonized most of the world. I mean, you would hire some local people to be your front people, whether it's in India or anywhere else. Before the American Revolution, they remember, right, Boston. And we throw their tea over the, you know. But the point is, it's the same old trick. You hire the local people who are going to run this thing and pretend this is really in the interest of the local people. And it's in the interest of these billionaires. And then meanwhile, they're greasing the skids in Washington. They've got some connections with the Brookings Institution. They've got PACs. They've got the Miners PAC. And then, yes, the executive officers, the local people here, make sure he greases the skids. And you'll probably find them on some other Federal Election Commission uh, reports, not just Senator Smith's. Um, but what happened is that this land swap is a way to get the land out from under the federal government. Because if it's federal land, it's subject to federal environmental regulations. Now you might say, with Scott Pruitt as head of the EPA, maybe I would prefer federal land. Well, there's a problem. This mine will take a while to build. And so you might actually get somebody in the White House who cares about the environment, and somebody at the EPA who might actually enforce the law, and then they wouldn't be able to have their mine or whatever. So they work a land swap. They bought the land around, the federal land, and they say, we're going to sell you the land in return. It's a, it's a swap to get out from under the law. That's the entire purpose of the deal. Now, this is being pushed before Senator Smith came along, but somebody persuaded her that you need to do this in order to get support in the iron range, which I guess would be now the copper nickel range. I mean, it makes zero sense environmentally. Economically, all the money is going up here to rich British playboys and Russian oligarchs and we're left with pollution. So I'm going to tell you, I don't care what happens in this Senate race, I'm not going to give up this fight. Okay. And 
I'll tell you one thing. I'm going to solve this problem if I do go to the United States Senate because I'm going to introduce legislation that's going to ban sulfide mining anywhere near major waterways, anywhere in the United States. <laughs> And then they will have that land pursuant to the Smith Amendment. They will have the land. And what are they going to do? They can build an amusement park on it. They can set up, you know, a, a scouting camp or maybe a resort. But they're not going to be mining for copper and nickel or anything else. No sulfide mining near major waterways. So this battle is not lost. But once again, we need to think not just locally. We're going to have to think nationally. Sulfide mining should be illegal near any major waterway. And we're going to get that through Congress, get signed by the president. And president, that is. Uh, but that's very, very important that we stand up to these people. We can't allow that in our state. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Painter, for coming here. I've heard, I've heard you numerous times uh, since the beginning of the year. And I, oh, it's not nice. oh, yeah. He's, yeah. How about this one? Can you Does it work now? Maybe you just have to put it close to your mouth. Yeah. Okay. yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, I've heard you from the beginning of the year uh, several times, and I really like what I, I've heard. And, uh, I was, I'm a delegate. Uh, I was a delegate in Rochester, and I heard you there as well, as probably many others have. And uh, I really liked uh, what I heard. I, I did vote for you uh, based on what I heard. And, uh, you know, I, I listen to one of the biggest challenges that I, that I run into, I don't know if it's a challenge or what, things that I run into when, I'm, when we're talking with other people uh, uh, that might be identified as some of the Democratic Party here, we talk to people who are Republicans, not because, you know, for, for whatever reason, but what I hear from Democrats is, well, he was a Republican, you know, and I try to tell them, you know, what I hear from you are values that I feel are representative, you know, are the kind of values that I, I feel are, are solid, are good democratic values, whether democratic or republican. I mean, uh, and so what I'd like to know, and you, you've talked about several things which, uh, you know, that prove to me that these are kind of the kind of values that I want in a senator. Um, but what I wanted to uh, ask is, uh, what are your thoughts uh, on the differences between, for example, the Democratic Party of today versus the Democratic Party of, say, before 1980? Uh, Democratic Party of today, I think both parties have changed a lot. Right. And I think the changes are related to each other. Um, I identified with what I called the moderate wing of the Republican Party for years, and now might be called the liberal wing. It's a little hard to think of someone as, you know, for example, former governor of, of Rockefeller of New York, uh, you know, multi-billionaire as a liberal, but they people call that a liberal Republican. Mike Bloomberg, uh, more recently mayor of New York City, a Republican, um, you know, I think he was a moderate, not a liberal. Uh, we, you know, but I view myself as that type of Republican. Arnie Carlson would be the closest uh, comparison here in the, in the state of Minnesota with that brand of Republican. Um, and if before 1980, the party was dominated by people who certainly pro-choice and abortion didn't think the government should be getting into, involved in that. Um, and the Republican Party has been unfortunately taken over by the religious right. Uh, Ronald Reagan let them get in in order to try and take away the Southern evangelical votes from Jimmy Carter, who was the only real evangelical we ever really had in the White House, but anyway. Um, and so that rightward shift in the Republican Party also on environmental issues was started under Reagan um, and it got steadily worse. Uh, rightward shift on a number of issues, particularly uh, when combined with campaign finance and what happens in campaign finance led to a very different Republican Party over the years. And when I try to sort of think, is there any way to pull this back toward a more moderate model? And uh, you know, I thought that was a dialogue worth undertaking in the Republican Party. It is not anymore. Uh, certainly not with Donald Trump. And combining Donald Trump with extreme right-wing ideology and the theocracy of someone like Mike Pence. Um, what has happened with the Democratic Party, though, is equally troubling. Because as the Republican Party shifts to the right, 
but they're getting extreme right on social issues. What that creates is a situation where a lot of people are looking to vote Democrat. Now that is good, but what started to happen in the 1990s was you had a lot of Wall Street people who wanted to vote Democratic, and that is good, but also vote with their contributions Democratic, which you start to wonder about, and President Clinton starting to go along to get along with respect to bank deregulation. This is the topic I have actually spent most of my time writing about since 1994 when I went into law teaching. And by the way, if anybody really wants to know my views, there's a longer paper trail on me than there is on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> because I have been a law professor and I write stuff. I love some corporate social responsibility and banker's ethics and the bad stuff going on on Wall Street. And the problem is that the Democratic Party uh, increasingly uh, was malleable to influence, particularly in the banking sector, and then increasingly in some of the other sectors, because of our system of campaign finance. We see some of that here. So that's their problem, is that if the Republican Party becomes so extreme, that then it's tempting for Democrats to take the money and then have a very pro-corporate agenda, even if the corporations aren't behaving themselves in a socially responsible manner, Wall Street banks, polluters, fossil fuel. And then the voters, of course, have no choice because the Republicans are running a nutshell. <laughs> but then are you getting a Democratic Party in that situation? I'm not saying this is pervasive in the Democratic Party, but it is a concern that is not focusing on the interests of the people. And that's, that's what we need to worry about. So it's that mixture of an extreme right-wing Republican Party plus our campaign finance system that is potentially toxic. And that's, that's how you get this, sort of the Wall Street mess, and, and we, I think, are cruising for another one, by the way. Now, you see some exceptions. Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. She's not going to let go of those Wall Street people. <laughs> so that was another question I had for you. How would you see yourself? Uh, what senator is present or that in the past more reflect your values and the way you would indicate to us you know, the kind of senator you would be? Well, I think that uh, we need, uh, the problem, we need to look to the future. And our biggest issues are uh, the environmental destruction. The climate change and environmental destruction is a critically important issue. The second is the stability of our financial system, not having another 2008, addressing economic equality, and putting in a single-payer health care system that can, at an affordable cost, provide health care for all Americans, so you have these sort of economic equality issues. And then third, obviously, world peace and non-nuclear proliferation. Uh, and being once again, getting the United States back into the world community. So there are bits of Elizabeth Warren there, bits of the Senator of Paul Wellstone. I mean, there are, you know, in terms, it, it, with respect to each issue, uh, you know, you can put together various, various people, I think, have done very good things. Um, uh, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Richard, <clears throat> what's your opinion on our standing senators sponsoring bills and uh, attempting to get bills with no judicial review? So which bills would that be? This type of thing? Yes. Okay, yeah, well the deal there is that it's a way to get around judicial review. In other words, that the uh, environmentalists in this land, they're trying to mine on federal land. The environmental groups like Sierra could go in and get a federal court to interpret the federal law and might even interpret differently than Scott Pruitt, who's too busy, you know, uh, I don't know what he's doing now. I hear he needs, uh, he, he has uh, a special pants. He needs tactical pants. <laughs> ask about that. But the thing is, even under the Trump administration, uh, the Sierra could go up, going to court and say, you're mining a federal land, we've got a federal judge make the decision. So what they're doing is a land swap. I think it's going to be, a, it, you could try to have some judicial review of the land swap or whether the swap removes the applicability of the federal law. Uh, but the problem is if Congress approves it, it's going to be an uphill battle. And it's really going to be, and it's something I want to remind everyone, you have to, we have to change Congress. Voting is critically important in primaries and in the fall. Yeah. Uh, 
really not really hard. Uh, so I don't think much of it at all, what was done here. But I'll tell you, that's another thing. Uh, you know, I'm not the person elected to Senate. If you want a special hot wire deal for Minnesota, particularly for a big company that wants something special, and you know, I, I just not the backroom deal type of guy. I just don't want to do that. So um, you know, I'm gonna focus on the big issue, and once again, I'm gonna solve this with the bill that outlaws self by mining anywhere near major waterways. I don't know if it's Wisconsin or Minnesota. I don't want it happening. Not my country. First, 2018, the National um, Energy Board uh, issued a request uh, for um, uh, threats online with chatter potential security threats. It's, and it seeks contractor to monitor vast amounts of online chatter for uh, potential security threats. And in this year, they tried to pass a bill in the House and Senate to uh, make a third party responsible for a protester's bad behavior. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it was downloaded off of a website called ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council. It's Funk Brothers. Yeah, and, um, and now they're seeking to um, go after anybody who has an opinion. And I'm wondering how you would um, deal with this. Well, first, I, I, I'm going to insist on uh, justices and judges going to courts who uh, vigorously enforce the First Amendment with respect to individuals' rights instead of making up rights, First Amendment rights for corporations in the Citizen United case and then ignoring individuals' rights. So that's one um, way to deal with this. Is the courts need to be very serious about the First Amendment of the Constitution. Um, uh, with respect to individuals. But second, we need to do something about the Koch brothers and this whole out thing. Uh, and they got a whole bunch of them. I went out in South Dakota and I helped them pass a referendum uh, where they're going to clean up campaign finance on the state level. And the voters approved it. Unfortunately, it didn't go in the Constitution of uh, South Dakota. So the Koch brothers went in, bribed the legislature, and overturned it. That was frustrating. Uh, you know, so they are hard at work. They're getting involved in Minnesota campaigns too. The Koch brothers are bad dudes. And uh, you know, along with the Mercer family, uh, there are a bunch of them. So we need to go to the root of the problem. Because you can always try to work all these special bills to try and hush everybody else up while they get their citizenry my First Amendment rights thanks to the 5-4 decision of the Supreme Court. But we've got to stand up to them. We're not putting up with it anymore. Could I ask you to look ahead and talk a little bit about your campaign strategy for winning should you get the win the primary like how are you going to deal with the flannel shirted people and the Koch brothers and the ads and all that look ahead and i'm going to talk to the real real flannel shirted people middle class people in this state who are not ceos you know dressing up to play the game but are affected by what goes on uh first of all economic inequality single pair of health insurance. That's a concern for a lot of people. And I'm going to broaden the base here. I mean, single pair health insurance is rightly characterized in some respects as a progressive cause, but it's a cause for every single American. I've talked to a lot of small business owners who are frustrated with the fact that they have to pay more for insurance for themselves and their employees than a big corporation. And when they can't recruit employees, if they don't have as good a health plan as whatever is offered at 3M, even though that, you know, that person, 3M is a wonderful company, but not everyone always want, wants to work at 3M. They may want to change jobs and work for a smaller startup and try something new or different. Uh, and so I think I can convince a lot of voters who might be a lot more conservative than I am on a bunch of issues. Uh, small business owners in particular who tend to vote conservatively that <coughs> this healthcare system is a wreck and it's hurting them much more then it's hurting people who have secure plans with big employers, either in government or big corporations. And so I want to talk to people about their economic interests and their real economic interests. Not some fantasy story that if we open up a mine up there that we're going to somehow create 250 minus jobs like five years from now. Uh, but you know, what, do we, what can we do now? Health insurance, number one uh, a concern. 
uh, and protecting the environment. We're all in this together. So I think we start talking about so talk to individual voters uh, and get away from the tribalism, the Democratic values versus Republican. You got Republicans wanting to vote Democratic and droves of them because they're sick and tired of what's going on in Washington with Donald Trump. But the one thing you don't want to do is start to touch labels. Focus on issues. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are so many. There's so many Arnie Carlson Republicans, in New York we call them Mike Bloomberg Republicans, whoever they are. Even the really conservative Paul Ryan Republicans. Some of them may detest this guy and actually not have health insurance. And I'm going to talk to every single one of those people. And we're going to get them to come on board and make this country a democracy again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> My uh, question has to do with the international situation. <clears throat> We've, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> We've been uh, told a lot about the uh, uh, Mueller investigation and the Russian connection, and there's a lot of confusion about this. And it could be a significant factor, and maybe it's bogus, but we, uh, we've just been kind of waiting around and waiting around. What is your opinion of the desire of Vladimir Putin and the Russian oligarchs to disembody, disembody this country? Oh, yeah. They definitely want to do that. And Bob Mueller is only going to be able to deal with a piece of it. He can only deal with what the Russians did in 2016 in criminal conduct. So collusion for him to prosecute would have to rise to the level of criminal collusion. Now that doesn't mean that we might have a different opinion in the House and Senate Judiciary Committee if we have a hearing. Or in the Intelligence Committee if they investigate something other than the Fox News story about a spy put by the Obama administration in the Trump campaign. That was actually a counterintelligence operation to find out who was collaborating with the Russians. That's what the FBI is supposed to do. So this is a serious problem that the Russians are up to. Bob Mueller will get at a part of it. And obviously Donald Trump is very nervous about Bob Mueller, particularly any time he gets anywhere near the money, the financial structure of the Trump organization. Now, I lived in New York in the early 1990s, well, in late 80s, very early 90s, before I went to law teaching in Oregon in 1993, and I remember that Donald Trump didn't pay people back, including $900 million worth of casino bonds. Well, New York bankers, like bankers everywhere else, like being paid back. <coughs> so he went to borrow his money somewhere, starting in 1994 or 5, and it wasn't from Citibank. It wasn't from Morgan Stanley. Goldman Sachs wasn't underwriting Trump bond deals after the casino bonds that Taj Mahal went bust. So he borrowed, borrowed his money somewhere. We don't know where. We just know he likes a lot of Russians. So we'll see what Bob Mueller finds out in this investigation. But this has been a long-standing pattern of conduct by Russia going back over you know, a century, since the 1917 revolution. They used communism to try to subvert Western democracies for a long time. We overreacted to that in the United States because we don't really have that much of a left wing that the Russians could take advantage of. It wasn't much. It was in very concentrated parts of the country, and it didn't do much. The big and most thing, you know, they got the atomic bomb, a few things. But, you know, the bottom line is they didn't destabilize our country. They destabilized a lot of democracies around the world, including Western Europe after World War I and again after World War II. So they've been up, up to this game for a long time. But isn't it ironic that the Republican point had a history of overreacting under McCarthy to what the Russians were doing here? And now, you know, we talk about the red menace or whatever you want to call it. Now it's actually happening that the Russians made it move to the United States. And they want to ignore it. Why? Because it's all about partisan politics. What the Russians discover is that while there is not a powerful left wing in American politics, outside of corners of academia, I mean, I probably deal on a day to day basis with most of whatever there is of a left wing, being in academia since 1993. There isn't much, but there is a potent, hateful, and significant, and racist right wing. Everything from the Ku Klux Klan to racist organizations in the Northeast and the Upper Midwest. 
And then the Russians decide to play that end of our political spectrum with Breitbart and the alt-right and all that. Then they hit, they hit Pater. And they got, they scored bigger. And we were completely taken unawares. And that's what they did in 2016, and they're gonna do it again. And it, we have Fox News covering for them and saying, well, somehow the FBI shouldn't be spying on people who are colluding with the Russians. I mean, like, what planet are we living in? It's a serious issue. Yeah. Is there anything we can do to get Fox News off the air? <laughs> <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> get Fox News off the air. We certainly don't want to get into, into trying to interfere with the free uh, freedom of the press. Uh, this is the problem, though. Is someone like Rupert Murdoch should not be controlling. We have the same thing with Sinclair Media. We I mean, people control a lot of stations, particularly radio stations. Uh, you know, people should. We should not be getting stations off the air because of their completely false content, which is called the Fox Fiction Channel. That's what I call it. Actually, I went on Fox News. I went on Tucker Carlson. I heard the Fox Chick Fox Fiction Channel. And Tucker got a little upset. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but concentration media is a serious issue. And the Federal Communications Commission has been dealing with this since 1956, or 19, early 1950s. I have a case in my case book I teach in 1956, where, of course, guess what? All the big newspaper industries try to go and schmooze the powerful United States senators and the FCC commissioners. What's new? Um, <laughs> in order to have more industry concentration. It's a serious problem. So that's something we do need to deal with. Is you need a, we have, need a more local media and decent. We shouldn't have Sinclair controlling radio stations all over the place and TV stations. It makes no sense. Right. Speaking of the present corporatocracy, um, Bill Gates today finally admitted that he was wrong about education and the over testing and over um, high stakes evaluation of teachers and students and schools. What, where do you stand on public education? Where do you stand on corporatization of public education in the form of uh, charter schools, corporate char charter schools, and the like? Yeah, first of all, you've got to get rid of Bethy to boss. Um, oh, wow. Um, the, uh, but going back before the atrocity of Bethy to boss, I think the No Child Left Behind Act was a mistake yes. uh, trying to have the federal government micromanage you know, what the standards should be at the state local level. I think that needs to be worked out at the state local level. You know, there are legitimate, there's a legitimate role for the federal government in education. And, uh, for example, making sure the schools are desegregated, you know, to preserve civil rights, provide equal education to boys and girls. There are a lot of things the federal government should be doing. But dictating testing standards uh, and curriculum is not one of them. The federal government has a legitimate role in providing some financial assistance for struggling school districts uh, because we do continue in many states to fund education through local property taxes. And that's a very difficult system to unwind. And rather than try to completely unwind it, it can help for federal and state governments to be providing additional financial assistance to uh, school districts that need that help. But it should not come with strings attached. You should not have the federal government saying, well, you only get the money if you report back some numbers on some tests. Uh, these tests are uh, standardized tests. I've never put much, I've <laughs> never liked them much. I didn't even like them when I was in high school and college. It was so easy to game the system. And that's the other thing. They say, well, you can't really prepare for them. No, the rich kid gets the tutoring they need and they prepare for them all. Um, so I don't, I don't even like them in college admissions, uh, SATs and ACTs and the rest of it. Uh, but the federal government should never be mandating something like that. Got it. You know, that's just wrong. So no child left behind, that needs to be revisited. And it finds out a lot of districts that had good numbers are just faking them. So you got educators acting like Wall Street bankers. Great. That's not what they should be doing. Um, the charter school thing. We have a charter school that's a real public school. And someone wants to start a real public school with a charter. That was the original idea. That can work if you have a school that has, uh, you know, unionized teachers, just like the public schools, where you don't pay the administrators more. You just might have a little different type of curriculum or something. I mean, I'm open to state and local government, you know, deciding to do that. But there needs to be a lot of scrutiny uh, of whoever's running these schools. That the first of all, they got to be really public schools, and uh, they should also be integrated. A lot of them are set up, and they end up with, uh, you know, they. 
they aren't integrated at all. It's, you know, the racial inequality problem, and that is not serving a public purpose. So if you have any public money going into school, it needs to meet certain basic standards with respect to the integration of the students, the pay for the teachers, and, and so forth. Um, uh, the whole, the, the next step beyond that is where you start to get into private schools that are taking vouchers. That's a no-go. That's just another way to, for people to try and get money out of the government to run their own school. It may be a religious school, it could be whatever, it could be really a for-profit school that's pretending it's not. Uh, you know, that's just more people feeding at the truck. We don't need that. We need public, public money for public education. And I'm not against private education, that's great, but private education fund itself. That's a separate yeah. thing. Yeah. And we got a very nice question. And Betsy DeVos, she's got her own financial conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. She did that best to stop. I would think she'd be hit up with a criminal statute for that, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I want to ask a question, too. Uh, I have a lot of friends who hold official positions with the DFL. And just last night, I was telling one of my friends that you were coming to talk with us. And I said, you should come and hear what he has to say. And she said, absolutely not. He's a Republican. I don't want to hear any word out of him. And I don't trust him, and blah, blah, blah. Will you tell us your story of conversion from being a Republican <laughs> to a Democrat so we have something to say back to them? Well, first of all, I do I just want to ask, uh, the question I would ask back is, is that the message you want to send in the voters in November? Or is that the theme up through the end of the primary and then after the primary is over, oh, we're the big tent, we want everybody in this party. Yeah. I mean, you want people to show up in November, and a lot of you may have voted for Republicans before to show up and realize that you've got the better candidates and candidates who are going to stand up against an authoritarian president of the United States. And so that's not a winning strategy. That's just possible. Oh, gee, I'm running into that. I'm going to tell you part of my history of the Republican Party. You know, if you criticize a Republican, you're not a loyal Republican. And then people tell me what the values are of the Republican Party. And they talk about, you know, Spending all this money in defense. And I told him about President Eisenhower's famous speech where he talked about the military industrial complex wanting to run up the budget and get us into wars. And yeah, he was, in, he was sort of a rhino. Hey, Eisenhower, rhino? Oh, interesting. <laughs> and then environmental protection. Oh, we gotta, we got to fall behind all this deregulation and everything. And I remind about Teddy Roosevelt and even Richard Nixon, as crooked as he was. Who, had, who established the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, I mean, we've had moderate Republicans. Mike Bloomberg he has led the fight against gun violence. I don't appreciate all the money in politics. So I wish we had a system where Mike Bloomberg wasn't putting in the millions of dollars on issues, but how about the NRA and all their Russian money or whatever they're doing? It's killing our kids. So there are many Republicans who've taken reasonable stands on issues. It's about the issues. So yes, I lived for a long time on the liberal, I thought it was the moderate wing of the Republican Party. Then they started calling it the liberal wing of the Republican Party. They said, you're a writer. Fine, I say goodbye. My positions on issues, if you look at what I've written since 1994, focusing on corporate fraud on Wall Street, I haven't reversed positions on issues. There are certain issues that are certainly Think about a lot more than single payer health insurance and how important that is to our economy and making that work. Because, and certainly I'm a lot more scared about climate change than many of us were 20 years ago. People have changed their views on issues somewhat, but I don't have it that much. It's about what's happened to the Republican Party. Arnie Carlson, former Governor Arnie Carlson, Republican, he backs my campaign. I told him about these issues. So find money. Shouldn't be near waterways. He agrees with me on that and on health care. And so when we start to talk about issues, I would challenge anyone who feels that way about me to ask me my position on issues. It's not about the label. I did choose to fight the fight. Yes, it's sometimes a lonely fight. Where I was in the Republican Party, there were many, many more people like me a while back in the Republican Party. And I chose to stay there. And I thought I did some good there. I was able to come out and say that Merrick Garland should get a fair hearing. And it came out, yes, as a Republican and said that. 
And now that article that I wrote in the New York Times is being used against me by people supporting my opponent. They said, well, he was involved in the appointment of Justice Alito and uh, Chief Justice Roberts. Well, yes, I dealt with their financial conflicts of interest, telling them what stock they had to sell in order to take the job. No one in the White House would have asked me my opinion about the ideal Republican appointee to the United States Supreme Court. Because you know what I would have said? John Paul Stevens, the guy in the bone cutting. Yeah, that's what I would have said. Or Justice Souter. And you can imagine what they would have said. So that's where I was in the Republican Party. But it's the Republican Party that left me. And I had left this country. And now, we have a doubt with all of those problems. The support of a president who is an authoritarian. And tragically, it's the United States Supreme Court letting one let him do whatever he wants. So um, I wish people would focus on the issues. But also, I'm going to stand up to power. And I've done it for the Republican Party, and I guarantee you, I can be a pain for the Democratic Party, too. They buy into this kind of thing, it's not happening. Not for me. And so that's where I am on the issues. And I hope people will just listen to me on the issues. They can disagree with me on the issues. But if we lose, use labels, uh, you know, I think it's very self-defeating. And it's going to be a disaster in November. Because most voters don't identify well. Increasing number of voters don't identify with either party as members of the party. It's not like the old days. Now, by the way, as for my history, I, I grew up in Central Illinois. Um, and I uh, moved there in 1972 as a kid. And I went back there to teach at the University of Illinois from 1998 to 2005. So that's where I really learned about politics. I watched the Nixon Watergate hearings and all that. But also there's that daily machine in Chicago. So everyone up there was Democrats. And you had ultra-conservatives. The old Mayor Daley, he was a racist. He wouldn't bring any African Americans to the Democratic National Convention. It was a machine. And down in mid central, central Illinois, of course, we didn't like the Democratic machine up there. So we vote, people vote Republican. You had liberals who voted Republican and conservatives who voted Republican. And yes, some people were just as racist as Mayor Daley voting Republican in Central Illinois and so forth. Uh, that's the, where I came in and I went back to teach in 1998 and I uh, uh, saw old friends and hooked up with the Illinois Republican Party. Uh, of course, we always talked about how the Democrats in Chicago were corrupt. Well, guess what? The Republican Party in Illinois was corrupt, too. So they had two governors serving their terms concurrently. One Democrat, one Republican in the federal penitentiary. <laughs> it's Governor Ryan and Governor Blagojevich. Now, Blago may get a pardon for the big dollar, right? So, um, but that's what I come out of. You know, I dealt with, it, uh, I dealt with challenging situations in politics. So my positions are on the issues. And I don't think just Democrats should be voting for me. It should be independents. And anybody who cares about our country should be voting at least for somebody who takes the positions I do on the issues. People don't like me, that's fine. At least fight for the issues. Thank you. choose rather than, I'm sure Senator Smith is a wonderful person, but she was appointed. So I think we all need to participate in choosing the best candidate. So. Good point. Well, it's really important. It's amazing how people I run into don't even know there's a primary on August 14th. Yeah. <laughs> and this is not good. Now, I think it'll be better this year because you have a gubernatorial race that's interesting, and people live in neighborhoods where there's some Republicans that are talking about that gubernatorial race. And, I don't know which of those guys is going to be worse. But anyway, uh, I think maybe more attention to the primaries. But this year, but primaries are absolutely critical. And this idea that you fix things at conventions and endorse candidates, and then everyone's just going to go fishing during the primary because you just rubber stamp, that is a terrible approach. And the only reason the DFL gets away with it is the Republicans do the same thing. Because voters are going to be 
really angry in November if they're cut out not only by the campaign finance system, which is, I call it the green primary, and I don't mean green party, <laughs> the money primary. That's what Larry Lessig, professor at Harvard Law School originally called the green primary. But you got that, and then you got these conventions before the primaries, and then nobody's really supposed to do any of the primary but vote for the endorsed candidate. It's an awful system, but the Republicans do it too, so the DFL gets away with it. Some people criticize Senator Tina Smith for endorsing uh, uh, Congressman Ellison for Attorney General instead of Matt Pelican, who is my former student at the University of Minnesota, a brilliant guy, who I think would be a great Attorney General. He's just young, but the job, he'd, he'd be great, and he's going to get it, and then along comes Congressman Ellison. You know, we can compare the two, and the voters should compare the two, but I'll tell you, I have nothing against Senator Smith for making that decision not to go along with the endorsed candidate. You know, and the Democratic Party should not be trying to force people to go along with the endorsed candidate, and also should not be favoring Senator Smith over me. They endorse Senator Smith, that's fine. But the idea that if someone wears my button, they're not welcome at a DFL event, exactly. that gets out there, and current Hennels is going to be going to the cleaners now. Yeah. Because that's not free speech, and that's not real democracy. The people decide in August. And that is the only way to win in November. And all of these efforts to work things out and to penalize people for supporting the wrong candidate or the unendorsed or whatever are going to backfire big time. It's a disaster for the DFL, only matched by the disaster over with the GOP. And wonder why the voters are so angry in November. So let's have a primary and then have a general election and then start telling Donald Trump that he's going to have to pack his bag. Okay. Uh, we have about five more minutes. We have to be out of here at 8.30. Okay. Uh, you mentioned executive compensation a couple times, and you know, that's, it's a huge problem. I think that people are making millions, billions of dollars, and they're getting benefits like a car and driver. Okay, the guy who's making millions gets a car and driver, while the employees who can't afford a car are federally required to make $7.25 an hour. When you look for apartments now, by the way, I'm not, I do not hold an office in the Democratic Party currently because I don't have a job, I don't have a career, I'm, I'm struggling by with jobs that don't pay enough to live on. So now when you look at apartments, they ask for you to make two and a half times the rent because they wouldn't have any renters when they're asking for four times the rent. Then it was three times the rent. Now it's two and a half times the rent because you want a studio apartment that's eight dollars an hour. You still have to make, or that's eight hundred dollars a month. You still have to make twelve dollars an hour. So yeah, the, the, the real problem is that people at the bottom aren't making enough. Hello, raise the minimum wage already. This, this should be, a, this is an ethics issue. But at the same time, the real problem is people taking more than your share. I don't know of any major religion that says, this person is so good, he is worth 400 times what everyone else is. That's not Christian, that's not Buddhist, that's not anything. Here's my proposal. Relative maximum wage. So if you just started a business and you have a few employees and you're not making much money, fine. Don't pay them that much. But when you, you and I, I propose that Congress should make this a federal law, set the factor, I would say 20 times, even 100 would be better. You as an executive cannot make more than 100 times what your lowest paid employee or contractor makes. And you can't, you can't cut out the contractors and say they don't count. And you can't ignore the stock options and all the fringe benefits of these guys. Their total compensation can't exceed the factor of whatever that the lowest paid person. And that would go, I, I don't know how to make it happen, so what I want to know is, do you, would you want to make it happen? Would you fight for that? Well, I assume that's an interesting approach to the I agree with you about the problem, absolutely. That's a very interesting approach. I'd like to look through how that would be implemented, uh, where you regulate the wages 
of the, the top as well as, of course, I do strongly support raising the minimum wage. Not only at 15, but I think that we get, that really people should be bringing a home less than 20. So uh, you know, I don't know if you can get employers to fork out 20, but you ought to have supplements or something, a negative income tax at that end that gets everyone up to where they'd be with $20 at least an hour um, on the low end. Now, what do you do on the high end? Um, the traditional approach that we seem to have forgotten about uh, is a so-called progressive tax system. And what amazes me, as long as going to progressives, groups that call themselves progressives, and I want to talk, like talk about how terrible the 1950s were. And there were some things that are much better now, now than in the 1950s. Uh, you know, for example, uh, race relations are better, although Donald Trump is trying to take us back there, uh, and gender equality, and there are things that are better. But the 1950s, they also had some things right compared with where we are today, the percentage of workforce that belong to unions. That's a large part of the problem, that somebody uh, 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 jobs, particularly uh, uh, clerical workers and retail workers, are not unionized, and predominantly uh, female jobs often are not unionized. They're held by women. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, you know, when you look at the unionized workforce, there's still a great deal of discrimination. Uh, that it's much harder for women to get unionized jobs uh, outside of government. So, uh, our decline of union power uh, is, has enormous economic effects. And it's discriminatory, and then women and minorities tend to be the last people hired into union jobs and the first people let go. Uh, so we've got that problem. Uh, we've got uh, the fact that our income tax uh, uh, top bracket was 90% during part of the 1950s under President Eisenhower. And now we got it down in the 30s. And so one approach to that problem would be the type of proposal you're making. The other is, you pay the CEO what the CEO makes, but you know something? When you're going over three, four hundred thousand or something a year, you know, probably the idea that you're worth that much, well, yeah, a little bit, sort of, but maybe 60, 70, some percent you ought to get back. I mean, we can discuss what the, what the uh, brackets ought to be, but for sure, when we were scared during World War II of Germany, and then scared of, of Russia, you know, perhaps hysterically scared during the Cold War, uh, you had a lot of rich people willing to pay those taxes. Uh, so it's our tax rate uh, that, you know, is part of the inequality, and they cut the tax brackets. Uh, so, you know, I think we need to revisit what is a fair system of taxation uh, when someone makes a lot of money. Because someone could make a huge amount of money with very few employees, and they make a killing. Why? Because they're charging you know, they take a drug and they increase the price by a thousand percent or something. Uh, obviously, there should be rules on that. That's part of healthcare, right? Single payer. But then also, if someone, if someone really makes a killing, is it really because they worked so much harder than the school teacher? You know, or the priest? Or, you know, the mechanic? Or the person who mows the lawn? In the cemetery? I mean, no! And at a certain point, we need to say, you know, you don't have to give all of it back, but give a fair amount of it back. That's part of your job. Your duty as an American. We're all in this together. My last thing about the, that the people who make all that money, the corporate executives. I wrote a book about this in 2015 about investment banks, the Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, all those outfits. You know, now they pay themselves a huge amount of money, and then the bank is hit with a fine, like Wells Fargo. Who pays the fine? The shareholders. Well, this book our co-author Clara Hills, another professor at the University of Minnesota Law School, came out in 2015. We said, how about this? Say, well, Mr. Blankfein, you want to run Goldman Sachs? You want 15 million a year to do it? You can take your 15 million. If Goldman Sachs gets hit with a big fine, as they frequently do, or even worse, they go under like Lehman Brothers, you're going to pay. You're going to pay personally a large part of that funding. And if they go under, you're going to be personally liable. Guess what? A lot of those banks on Wall Street were actually run that way through the 1970s and 80s. They were partnerships. If the bank failed at Lehman Brothers, Mr. Lehman paid. Mm -hmm. Bob Lehman's guy ran that firm. And gee, I wonder why they didn't voice around so much. <laughs> and then they turned it into a corporation where you have limited liability. You raise a lot of money from shareholders, a lot more from debt. And you go to Vegas with other people's money. 
Well, obviously, anybody gets a chance to go to Vegas with other people's money and who has no morals will do that. But we've got to put a stop to that. So I said, make some some of these, I the, have the, the monkey marks in these banks or whatever other business. They want to pollute the environment. They get hit with a big <coughs> fine or liability or something. Don't just make the shareholders pay. Make the people running the place pay. Yeah. That is yeah. Pleasure to speak with Senator Elizabeth Warren was interested in this. I'd love to have you in my book and talk about it in her office for about 45 minutes. She's really interested in this idea. Uh, but then she knows full well that all those PACs and super PACs are run by the Wall Street people will come after her. But then they're coming after her anyway. I said they're coming after you anyway, Senator. So might as well go all the way on this. Make them all liable when they mess up. But that's a very, very important issue. I mean, the inequality is huge today compared with the 1950s. And it feeds into the continuing racial inequality and gender inequality, and uh, other inequalities in our, and, and also rural regions, increasingly uh, are falling behind. And that leads to a lot of the anger in rural regions that Donald Trump then comes and takes advantage of because he's gonna be their Lord and Savior. Right. How many of those people in Duluth were really from Minnesota? I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it at all. But um, we're going we're gonna to be telling him to pound sand. Uh, so we got a lot of work to do between now, August primary, yep. take your pick, and then November. We're going to let them know we know business.